Like I said, we're in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. And they say this. They say, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him into every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If someone who promotes, someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will say to you, stay, stay, uh, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house, and whenever you enter the town and are welcomed, eat what you are offered, what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. All right, so we're continuing in our series where we're, we're looking at harvest and what it looks like to prepare for harvest, spiritual harvest specifically. And uh, as we dig into this passage today, I want you to take a look on the back of your note sheet. I've, uh, those of you who know me know that I am one of these people who fill my calendar really full. I like to be busy. I like to have a lot that I'm doing and a lot that I, I want to accomplish. Things that I believe God's put a, a, a desire and a dream in my, my head for and in my heart for. And I know that this is common with a lot of people who are busy and have a lot on their schedule, that we can get to a point where we try and figure out, am I busy just for the sake of being busy, or am I busy in things that truly matter? So early in my, my management and leadership career, probably 20 years ago, uh, I saw this matrix. And in this, this matrix here, you can imagine it where there would be a line here, like a, a, like a grid. And... Uh, on this side, on the far left, what you see is the things that aren't urgent. And on the far right, you see urgent. And then on the up and down line, you would see at the top things are, are important, and on the bottom, you would see things that are not important. And so with, with leading and with, with tasks in business, and, and that was where we were specifically looking at this, the idea was to take the things that we have in our day, in our schedule, um, this, I don't know who this originated with. The, the training I heard was, uh, 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 was it Franklin Covey? Yes. Okay, I didn't say it. I think that was the one that, that I had heard. And, and as we went through it, we started going through and putting things down. And you started to see what things were not important, but that you were giving them urgency with, what things were, uh, were urgent that you were trying to get done, but they really weren't all that... that um, that important, the things that were important but not urgent, uh, and how you decided what things fit in there. And as we look at today, we're going to see Jesus pointing out some things to the apostles and to his followers that are both important and urgent. The, the things that would fall under that, that number one in that time management matrix. Now, if you were to look at your life and start to think through, and I'll just ask you to think through this in the back of your mind, the things that you do on a daily basis what things go in the important and urgent, the important not urgent, the not important not urgent, and not important and still urgent. And, and we'll get back to that in a minute. We'll come full circle to that here in a little bit. Because as we look at, the light, at this situation here in Luke chapter 10, we see some things happening. We see that, that Jesus is talking not just to his apostles, not just to the 12 chosen, uh, taking a step back, Jesus had his, his three really close friends. Well, at first he had his closest friend, which is believed to be John. And then he had his, his next, you know, like his three that were closest, that were the Peter, James, and John. And then he had his 12, you know, core, this is his group, his, his people that he hung out and did, did most of his life with. That was the 12. But then he had another group of influence, people that he was connected with, uh, which is often referred to as the 72, maybe it was 120. We don't know how big that other group was, but we know there was another group there. 
And in this, we see Jesus addressing specifically 72 of them. These would have been not the 12 apostles, but, but 72 others. And we're not exactly sure on the timing of when this took place. Uh, I don't know about you, but I like to know all the details. And sometimes I can paralyze myself trying to figure out how every detail comes together. The reality on this, when I was looking at it, is there's actually debate on the exact timing of when this was. Was this right before Jesus was going to go into Jerusalem? Was this before or after a time when he had sent out his apostles that we'll talk to in a little bit? And we don't really know, but, but that doesn't seem to be really relevant, because if it was relevant, I think Jesus would have given us more of that background. But what we do know is that Jesus is sending these people out ahead of him, these 72 out ahead of him, and kind of saying, hey, go make a way. Go, the, go into these, these other communities and, and tell them about me. Now, the number is 72, which that's actually a little bit debated as well. Um, some texts say 70. Some say 72. I tend to lean towards the 72 uh, as being more substantiated. But either way, it seems to be a tie back to something that the, the people would have been very familiar with. Now, in, in our day and age today, not everybody is raised knowing the same stuff. Our schools teach different things, and, and, or, or, the, or whether we're homeschooled or we're in a Christian school or a public school or a whatever other school, the, the idea is to teach certain subjects, but it's not all taught the same. Not everybody comes out knowing the exact same things. However, in this day and age, with the Jewish children, they would have all been raised with a teaching on, on the Old Testament, a teaching on the Torah. So they would have been very familiar with Moses and the things that happened in, in Moses' life. And it appears that Jesus may be calling back to something that they would have been familiar with, a story that we actually talked about in VBS this summer with the kids. And it is when Moses is leading the people and he is overseeing all of the stuff that's happening with all of the Jews, all of the children of Israel. And his father-in-law shows up and starts to watch what's going on and the chaos of the busyness of everything happening. And his father-in-law says, whoa, this is not good. You cannot do it all. And then he transitions from saying, you cannot do it all to saying, you need to appoint some people that you can trust to delegate some responsibility to. Any guess on how many people he appointed? Seventy. That's why the debate's there. <laughs> but I appreciate you making the guess. <laughs> yeah. so, so, the, uh, so Jesus seems to be calling back to this situation and giving, giving authority away. Not that Jesus is no longer God, but he's saying, I don't do it all myself. I call on my children. I ask my followers to carry some of the workload. And so he sends out these 70 or 72 that are there. If you want to look back at it in the Old Testament, it's Numbers eleven sixteen. But it's a great example of leadership and delegation that we see in the Old Testament, and that we see that Jesus is doing some of this as well. There's actually some thought by, by some, and again, I, I can't prove this because they don't list who they are, but there's some thought by some that there's a good chance that some of these that Jesus sent out and was teaching them how to evangelize, how to reach out, encouraging them to step out. There's a chance that, and some believe, that those were people that went on to be the elders in the early church. Because if you, if you look in the New Testament you will see that there are elders in the church. And some are questioning, I wonder if these people are the same, some of the same ones. We don't know. It's not a definitive thing, but that's one of the questions that is out there. Now, if you're wondering, I'm going to just give you a quick, couple quick things on how I get to the fact that Jesus had a group of followers that was still with him. Maybe it was 72, maybe it was 120. We don't know exactly how many were following him. We can read about that in Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, we see that in verse 15, it says, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. This is the time when, when Judas has betrayed Jesus. He's gone and hung himself. And uh, they're saying, well, there's supposed to be 12. So we need to pick who the 12th one is that God would have in our group. And in that conversation, Peter's saying, well... We've got about 120 of us to choose from. 
who would God pick out of this 120? And he says in verse 21, he says, therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men that have been with us the whole time. It wasn't that these were a group that had just shown up. These are people that had been following Jesus all along. They weren't his closest group, but they were a, a part of a bigger group that was following from him, following him and learning from him as he was doing his ministry. The reality in our lives and in mine is I can try and do things on my own, like I said. Uh, you all know that. It's part of the reason uh, friends like Bill call me on it and say, why are you doing all that? It's part of the reason that Mike and Sue say, uh, why don't we clean the building instead of you doing it? Uh, sometimes I need people to say, hey, hey, Sam, you can't do it all. We're willing to help. And sometimes I need to just man up and ask myself. But uh, when we don't ask others and when we don't invite other people into what we're doing, we're cheating others of the opportunity to be a part of something great. If Jesus had never invited people into the ministry he was doing, there would not have been those people prepared and equipped and trained to lead the church after he was gone. And Jesus is big on us not doing stuff alone. God is pretty big on not doing stuff alone. And we can look back to the, the earliest parts of the Bible. Uh, he said that it was not good for Adam to be alone. Uh, and that's right at the beginning. Throughout all of Scripture, we see times when they put somebody else with them. I alluded to Moses. In Moses' case, Moses is like, I can't do this on my own. And he keeps whining to God like some of us do at times. And God sends Aaron. But what's interesting is when you read that text, Aaron was already on the way. It wasn't like, like this was God throwing his hands up and saying, you're right. You're not going to do it on your own. I can't. You can't. So let me find somebody else. God already had a plan for Moses not to do it on his own. And then even as time continued, as we look, it wasn't even God's desire that Moses lead all of the people by himself. He had, he had a plan for more people to come and help lead. In this situation here, we see that Jesus doesn't say, okay, I've got you going out here, I've got you going out here, I've got you going out here. Good luck, I hope it all goes well for you. No, he, he sends them out in groups of twos. Because we need people to walk with us. We need people to encourage us. We need community. You were not meant to do life or experience life on your own. I was not meant to experience life on my own. Now, I'm not saying that that means that we are supposed to all be married because if that's what God was saying, then, then Paul would have been going against what God said when he said it's okay for you not to be married. In fact, I think it's good for some of you not to be married. And since we know that the Bible is God's word and that it cannot conflict and contradict itself and still be truth, that means that, that not doing it alone doesn't mean it has to be with a spouse. In fact, we can look at Paul's life and see that Paul didn't do ministry alone. He always had someone with him. Whether it was Titus, whether it was Barnabas, whether it was Timothy, go on and on and on. He didn't do ministry alone. He didn't intend us to do ministry alone either. He didn't intend us to do life alone. We need community. There's a reason in Ecclesiastes it says that, that two are better than one. And it goes on to say that because they have a good return for their labor, if either one of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity to the one who has no one to help them up. Jesus knew this when he was sending them out, and he sent them out in two. So they had people to walk together with, to encourage them when they got frustrated, to, to celebrate with when things went well. He knew that they couldn't do it alone. In fact, he knew it so much that it was bigger than them. He tells them to ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers or, or pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers, depending on what your translation says. Because he knew that there needed to be more people. Now what's interesting in that is, and you know I get hung up on words sometimes, the word pray or ask. I think some of us have, have probably got a misconception of what this is that Jesus was saying. Because when we hear, well, I need to pray for you, or I'm praying for you, it kind of is a, 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 it's important, but it doesn't always have real urgency. It, it can be that idea of, hey, hey, Ben, why don't you come do this with me? No? Okay, that's good. Or, hey, if you don't have anything going on, why don't you do this with me? That, that can be the idea when we're asking somebody to do something. But that word that's used there is actually deathete. Sorry, I had the pronunciation before and I lost it. Um, but it's, 
it conveys a pressing need of something. In fact, in, the, in Luke chapter 5, when there's the, the, one of the guys with leprosy who's begging to be healed, he says this. He says, while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. That word begged is the same word that's translated ask or pray. Jesus is saying, beg God. Plead with God that He would send other people. Not simply just, I hope, I hope it works out for you. I hope some other people are there. But those, those 72 were also kind of an answer to their prayer, but then there was others that they were praying and begging that God would send as well. It's, it's important for us to be mindful of, of us not doing it alone and not just hoping someone shows up to help, but begging that God would send people to serve with us and serve alongside us. Now this situation is very similar to that that the, the disciples experienced. Um, when, when we look in Matthew chapter 9, and then going into chapter 10. In Matthew 9, we say that then Jesus said to his disciples, he's speaking to the 12, he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the field. And then he says, similarly, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. He, he sa says that he's sending them out seemingly helpless and weak, but yet God is on their side, and he follows it up was saying, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them falls to the ground aside from your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. When we look at the idea that God might be sending us to do something and sending us we can get hung up on what ifs. Or maybe that's just me. Well, what if I ask them and they don't want to? Or they say something that they take it wrong? Or, or well, what, if, what if this isn't the right time? What if, th this last week I was driving through uh, Trent. And as I was driving through Trent, I saw a lady out in her yard um, doing some work. Seemed to be struggling with something. And I did this, this number, and maybe you've done it before. I, I felt that prompt, like, oh, you should stop and see if everything's okay. And then I was like, what? Well, what if she thinks I'm just some crazy guy, some old man coming to, to harass her? Or what, if, what if she thinks that I'm looking down on her because she's a, a woman? Maybe, that, maybe she thinks that. Or what if, and what if? And I was rationalizing all of this stuff. Maybe none of you do that. But, but I was rationalizing, and I got about to the other side of Trent, which doesn't take long if you've been through Trent. And um, I was like, okay, God. Maybe that was you. I'm going to turn around. I went around and I talked to her and uh, she, she explained what was going on and it was no big deal. And I don't know, I don't know why that was on my, my heart, why I felt that prompt to stop. But I know that many things in our lives when we, we know that God's calling us to something or we think he might be, we go to the, the what ifs. I, you know, God, I, I think you're calling me to this, but you know, I'm busy raising a family, and you told me that I need to raise a family, and I need to raise them to love you. So I think that, that probably uh, that's for later. Or, or there's this, yeah, but I'm in the middle of this, this job that's going really well, and I'm advancing up the ladder, God, so don't you want me to wait till I get that big promotion? Because then I'll be in a position to even influence more people. So maybe I should wait on this, and, and what, what if I do this and it affects that? that? That can't be what you want, but I'll get to it. Or, or, or it's the, well, what if, what if I, I don't take this job? How do I provide for my family? Or what if, and we keep going on and on and reasoning why it's maybe not what God wants us to do. But yet he says that he knows all the details of our lives. Everything. Down to the number of hairs on our head. And for people like Mike and I, that's not as many as for some of you, but, but I couldn't leave myself alone on that one, Mike. Sorry. I agree with you. <laughs> all right. But the reality is, he knows all of the details of our lives. He knows everything that's going on. 
and he cares about it. And when we're going through the, yeah, God, what if, what if, you're not thinking of something that he hasn't already thought of. He's not going, oh, shoot, you're right. You better hold on to that job and work that way up because I hadn't thought of how that might come out. That's not where he's at. And he wasn't that way with these 72 either. In fact, he had told them something that may have made absolutely no sense. He said to them, he said, go with urgency. He said, don't grab your bag. Don't grab an extra pair of shoes. Okay, that would be for me. When I travel, I always bring multiple pair of shoes. Uh, I know I don't say what you want, but it, maybe it's a pair of sandals. Maybe it's a, a comfortable pair of shoes and a tennis shoes. I don't know. But Jesus is saying, hey, don't grab a bag. Don't grab sandals and just go. He said, in fact, don't even take time to say hi to anybody along the way. And then when we kind of go to that, at least if you're like me, I'm like, wait a sec. I want to talk to people along the way. But the reality of what Jesus was saying wasn't, wasn't just can't say hi. It was don't go through, go through the long, drawn-out greetings of that day. You know, for us, it's a, hey, how's it going? And we keep right on going. In his day... It, there seems to be a lot of discussion on what the exact greetings looked like, but everybody seems to agree that they were long, drawn-out greetings. They may have included kneeling and kissing someone's hand, and then them kneeling and kissing the other person's hand, and then it may have been a shake and a kiss on the face. The reality, of the, the, the truth of that time is it wasn't quick and keep going. It was a long, drawn-out thing. And, and I think about that as I was reading this and, and thought, man, can you imagine if you were in a medical situation and, and something that was urgent and the doctor got distracted. I remember when, when Miriam was, when Eve was giving birth to Miriam, and, and we were there, and we didn't know anything about it. I mean, we had gone to the classes and whatever, but we were clueless. And I remember telling the, the nurse, and talking to the nurse, and she's like, all right, just wait, it'll be a little while, it'll be a few hours. I'm like, what? What do you mean a few hours? Are you ready? And, and she's like, well, I'm going to call the doctor, and I, I talk to him. And I'm like, yeah, he should be here. And she's like, well, he's going to finish up his golf. I'm like, Golf? I, can't, I think that's what it was. And there just didn't seem to be the urgency. But sometimes that's our approach. That's our approach to reaching our neighbors. That's our approach to obeying God. And unlike that situation where the doctor knew what he was doing, he knew that she wasn't going to give birth in the next 10, 15, 20 minutes. He knew where, where things were at. Now, she did come much quicker than he thought she was going to come, so he did end up bracing in at the last minute. But the, the truth of it is, if you were to approach, you were to have a doctor approach your medical emergency with a, yeah, I'll get there, and if you saw your doctor walking down the hall and stopping while, while someone that you cared about was here struggling for life, and they're like, hey, how's it going, buddy? And they're having this conversation, I'm guessing you would be probably a little upset. But yet in our own lives, when it comes to reaching a world around us with Jesus, we seem to be okay with pushing that off and delaying it and coming up with different rationale for why we delay it. Now, thankfully, Jesus didn't just say, hey, go. He then walks them through a little bit of the how to go. And he says to them a number of things. He tells them where to stay and what it's going to look like. Um, because that's another place where we can get paralyzed with, well, okay, God, but how? What's this going to look like? But notice he didn't get too specific. He didn't say, hey, you, Joe, you're going to go stay with Aunt Mary and, uh, and her husband and their family. They're going to take care of you. No, he just said, go. Find someone, figure it out, go. He didn't give them all the answers. They had to kind of walk out on faith. And then the next part of the how was that they were to go and heal and share the love of Jesus. They weren't to just go and do good things and hope that people figured out why they did good things. They were to go hand in hand. For us, sometimes we, we get hung up on the, the doing good things and loving like Jesus. And that's important. That's extremely important. That's part of what we're about as a church. But if all we did, and I'll put that in quotes, if all we did is love people like Jesus and not take the time to tell them why we love them, then we're not much different than a generation of young people that's coming up now that has a passion for social activism and has a passion to do good for other people. Their motivations may be different than ours and probably are different than ours, but to a world around, 
Do they realize that the reason we're doing this is because we love them and because there is a God that loves them and because we want them to know what it's like to have a hope that can only be available through Jesus. It's not just about how they put food on the table. It's about a God who cares about the hurts and the hang-ups in their life, a God that desires to provide a hope for not just today but for their future. Now, at the same point, if we miss the other side and we jump straight to the telling people they need Jesus, we don't have a whole lot of credibility either. Because there's plenty of people telling people what they believe and what they should do. I'm, I'm guessing over the, la over the next several months, you're going to have somebody telling you who you should vote for. Just guessing. They don't know anything about you, but they'll tell you what you need to do and what you should do. Or maybe it's a, another person who will tell you what you should do, but they don't know anything about you. When in reality, Jesus says, hey, go love them, care for them, show them that you care about them. And then when you're showing them that you care about them, then tell them about Jesus and tell them about what I've done. Pastor Richard likes to say this. He stole it from somebody and I, who stole it from somebody who stole it from somebody. We don't know where the original words came from. But he says this. He says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And there's a lot of truth to that. We don't have much credibility until people know that we care about them. So as you look at that chart on the back of that, that deal, start to think about what in your life do you have that's not important or not urgent that may be taking your time? It might be games on your phone. It might be Netflix. And I'm not saying that these things are bad. Let, let me be very careful to say relaxation is extremely important. Jesus talks a lot about it. God talked about it. He, in fact, he commanded it with Sabbath. But sometimes we just mindlessly waste time. And that would probably be on the not important, not urgent we can get to the not important but urgent, um, and often those are things that we're doing because someone else has guilted us into it, um, or, or other things that you may think of. And then we get to the really, the, the critical area, which is the important and maybe not even urgent. Those are things like exercise. It's not urgent, but it is important because if you don't take care of yourself now, you're going to be forced to take care of yourself later when something goes wrong. It may be the idea of Sabbath and rest because that's important but if, if you're not doing it now, you're probably going to end up sick and forced to do it later. There's many other things that are there. Oil changes. Th that's one. Important, not always urgent. If you've waited if you wait long enough, it will become urgent. Um, and then you'll have other issues, most likely. Um, even as we, we look at the maintenance on this building. It was important years ago, but we didn't get to it right away. And then it got to a point where it was urgent and needed to be done this fall because we were getting to a point where we were having issues with bats, we were going to have issues with water, we were going to have other issues. It became urgent. If we don't deal with those things that are important, eventually they will become urgent. But then when we look at that important and urgent, there are some things, and some of those things, one of those things that I want to challenge you today is that it is important and urgent that we're out sharing the love of Jesus with the world around us, with people who are hurting, with people who seem to have it all together, with people that seem that it's all falling apart. God has called you and me to share the hope of Jesus, loving them like he did, and not just loving them like he did, but actually telling them about him a God who wants to do something new in their life, who wants to take the broken mess that they're in and make it something new. We've said it a lot in this church, in the Rescue Church, and so this is a lot of review. But God's plan to reach the world with the Gospel, it's you. It's His church. There is a loving God who made a way for people to have a relationship with Him. He did the hard work of coming to earth and dying on the cross so that we could have forgiveness, so that we could have hope, so that we could have a future, so that we could have a relationship with a loving God. And then he's asked us to go and send. Go and share and pray that God would send others to go and share. Church, he's calling you 
and he's calling me to do that. And if you were to look on your list, my question is, where does that land? It, where does sharing the hope of Jesus land? Would you put that in your important, not urgent one? Maybe in yours it goes in the not important, not urgent. I mean, if you're truly honest, where is it in your life? And when was the last time that you prayed and begged and honestly sought God, saying, God, bring people because there is a world around me that's hurting and needs to know what you have. Let's pray. Our God, we're thankful that you have invited us to be a part of what you do and who you are. We're thankful for people who set an example of this. We're thankful that you set an example of this, Jesus. And uh, God, I just pray that you would put a desire in our heart, a, a love that says, I, I can't go through another day without looking for opportunities to share. God, we're sorry for those times that, that we have come up with excuses. I'm too busy. i got to get to this thing or that thing. Uh, you know, I'm going to wait and deal with that when I retire. I'm going to wait till my kids are out of, out of diapers, or I'm going to wait till they're out of elementary school, or I'm going to wait till they're out of school in general, or, or I'm going to wait till they're graduated college because that takes a lot of my money. Or, uh, we come up with all sorts of reasons, God, to put you on the back burner. And we're sorry for that. God, convict us of that. Prompt us to put you at the forefront and to realize that all that other stuff we can't bring with us, but God, that you have given us an opportunity to bring people with us. Motivate us to that, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage challenge and inspire you in your faith journey to hear our messages live head to one of our physical campuses if you'd like to learn more about the rescue church please visit us online at therescuechurch.com or email us at office at therescuechurch.com